seeing my father on my graduation day was the best day of my life. I was so happy. Someone said that you know, I'm not interested in politics. That person is also interested in politics because he's talking about politics that he's not interested in. We should not be uh, marginalized that I'm a single and a Hindu, I'm a Muslim or a Catholic or Buddhist. You should not separate yourself. We are Sri Lanka. We should build a country together out of the Singaporean state. All around the world, we have China town, but we have China city in Sri Lanka. As I promised, I'm back with another segment of the Fernandez Vlog with uh, another interesting young guest. I would like to introduce himself like this. Actually, he's a doctor and he is representing the youth of the Sri Lanka. And also, uh, once he's a doctor and he returned to the political aspects. So, uh, by name, he's the Dr. Kamal Javadu. Welcome to you, sir, our program. Thank you very much. And I really appreciate you that to accept our invitation for this program. First so, and foremost, thank you very much for coming to my office. And uh, I'm sorry that you know, it took some time for us to start the program. No, no, but no. Uh, it's a great opportunity to meet you finally. And uh, thank you for having me on your program. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, you have been, uh, if I started like this, you have been inspired this field, like means uh, the politics and the social services from your childhood. I think uh, the, the basically with the, your father, the later Dr. Shaila Chabartana. If you will remember these memories, like how it's going? It was like this. Uh, my late father, Dr. Shaila Chabartana, he was a people's man. He was always wanted to do something in terms of socially, politically and be a, a role model for the country. So he had been always uh, working towards the innocent people of this country. Especially when he got into politics, he was involved in uh, resolving the issue in know, the needs and uh, he went to uh, Jaffna, he went to the more affected areas and uh, he was trying to help the people there, the innocent Tamil people, especially in conducted health camps, eye camps, medical camps. And uh, he was a very open-minded in terms of, he was a true Sri Lankan. He was never a racist, he never treated anyone uh, by their ethnicity. So, um, I saw that in my father and I saw the, the work that he was doing and uh, I, I also felt when I was a kid that one day I wanted to be a politics The way my father was involving, uh, resolving the Sri Lankan economy. So, people, there were people who were against him, tried to punish his name by saying that he's a LGBT, LGBT person and uh, and so on and so forth. But he was so motivated, he was so determined to go forward and stand by the rights of the people. And he was humanitarian, he stood for human rights, democracy, accountability in terms of what was happening at that time. So he stood by all those things. And then uh, I also felt that I should take up that challenge. And, uh, when I was a kid, my father always said, no, I'm in politics, he always advised me to continue my studies, he always told me to be a good doctor. And whatever he said, I took it to my head. And I practiced. I studied. I graduated. I think seeing my father on my graduation day was the best day of my life. I was so happy. And then after he passed away, you know, I had it. It didn't mean that uh, I should be in politics. So, by the invitation of former uh, Prime Minister Narasimha Gandhi, from a signal, I decided to uh, practice that for uh, provincial council election from the Ampar district. And the people in the Ampar district who loved my father, they loved my father, they really embraced me as a young Korean politician. 
But you studied uh, with the, as a doctor, but you entered into the politics recently. Yeah, so are you happy I, with that, the politics or is your passion to... I, I studied medicine, as I said before, hmm. in my mind, heart to heart, I was a soft corner to politics and I wanted to get into politics. I, I really badly wanted to get into politics when I was young. And with time, it grew further. So, I mean, I'm very much passionate about politics. I'm very excited about politics. It's a very interesting field. You know, if you are here for a good reason, if you are here for a good cause, you can do a good fight. You know, it's a, it's a battle, it's a challenge. You know. it's, it's not very easy to do politics. Politics is something that you, know, you are not being appreciated all the time. And especially in Sri Lanka, you see politicians are being corrupted, politicians are being uh, involved with the uh, breaking the law. So uh, the reputation of politicians in Sri Lanka is not very uh, good, but yet, you know, we have a duty. We have a duty. We have a duty for this time. So we can't just leave aside, uh, see 225, all politicians are corrupted, all politicians are uh, involved in bribery and so on and so forth. And if you label that, and if all good men and women leave politics, you know, then we are heading to a disaster. So we have to take that challenge. And I tell the youth in this country, you know, take up the challenge, it's a difficult task. You know, Mahatma Gandhi said, we need the change we want to see. So we have to work for that change. We have to educate people. You know, in Sri Lanka we have some sort of literacy rate. But I always say that, you know, we have that literacy in terms of read and write, but political literacy is it's almost zero. It's almost zero. Uh, but nowadays, that uh, as you said, that uh, youth has to come up with the politics and in the society, because youth are, youth are the future of the country. But nowadays, the youth is not uh, much more engaging or entering into the politics. Why is that? It's, it's like this, uh, in the 70s, the youth, really got involved in politics and we remember the JVB, how the JVB uprise and you took arms uh, in South, in North, uh, LTV and Tamil groups took arms and then they somehow managed to get involved in democracy, now they are in parliament. So it has evolved, but the current today is might not go for a rally, might not take part in a protest, might not actively see, be seen in politics, but they are doing politics on social media. They are engaged in some sort of way in politics. You know, we can't get rid of politics. Because back in the day, with a different set of politicians and different set of culture of politics. But right now, it's all connected because you know why? It's a global city now. With the social media, with the media platforms, electronic media, social media, printing media, all that interviews politics. It's directly or indirect. So, in terms of if someone says that you are not interested in politics, that person is also interested in politics and is talking about politics that is not interested in politics. The reason he's not interested in politics is because he has been studying about Sorry. politics, what's happening in politics, because he's disappointed in the politicians and our What happened in the current situations so and all it's, it's very difficult to omit politics and move on. You know, you, you need good politicians, political culture for you to survive in this country. So some people say, you know what, I don't vote this. I'm not going to vote this. It's not worth voting. But that is wrong because you know why your vote counts, right? And, and maybe you can do a, you can make a change. So people who have the knowledge, people who are being educated, they can decide who are going to be their next leaders. We, you know, sometimes we make wrong decisions, sometimes we make the wrong choice. But yet, we must give it a try. We can't just, uh, you know, forget about the world and forget about politics and just do your own thing. That's not going to happen. Because you know what? At the end of the day, politicians are going to be in this country. They are going to be 
close to you. You know, that's what the parliament does. And uh, of course, we have a president uh, who has so much of power, I would say, uh, autocratic power, right? So, either way, it's a structure built on politics and social uh, system. So, for social well being, you need a good political system. Yeah, uh, currently our country is facing a lot of problems like uh, fuel issues and then financial crisis. Like financial crisis and then the. the well, it's a reason in mm -hmm. like this. Now, in the financial management and mismanagement of this government, the most important thing is for a country that you have to have your income for the country, right? So, we had around 2,000 million rupees of income from taxpayers directly, directly. Now we went to the EPF, ETF as well. <laughs> and then what they did as soon as they came to power, they gave concessions to big companies who have helped them during their time of election. Here, back in BT, we told him, they gave concessions. So our government revenue came down to half. 50% we lost the revenue for the government. So what they did, those are the direct taxpayers for the country. Government had to put that burden into indirect taxpayers. So when you do that, automatically the price of fuel, price of food, price of other things, essential items would go up. While that is happening so, the government had no strategical plan how to manage the loans that the government has taken, right? So since they did not restructure the loans, we went to dawn for a dollar crisis. While the government is holding the dollar for 203 rupees, in black market it's around 250 or more, sometimes fluctuate. So what, what happens? Whoever works in the road, all our foreign remittances. Nobody wants to send the money to the national banks because you know, when you withdraw the money, you get a less amount. Yeah. But yet, if you do it to Havana or India, you get a bigger number. Bigger amount than the so, yeah. so, government again lost revenue there. And apart from that, what happened? Government started to basically convert or um, immediately exchange 25% of foreign remittance which comes to the country of any businessman immediately to rupees. So that led some of the businessmen not to bring their money back to Sri Lanka. So this is a vicious cycle. So, as so why that is happening? Another thing, how you get dollars by exports. To export, we, we don't have raw materials. We have to import raw materials. So, to import the raw materials, we need dollars. So, you can't open LCs because we don't have dollars in the hand. So, again, it affected exports. So, since it's affected exports, again, we have come back to the financial, financial dollar crisis number that we are facing right now. Apart from that, right, there are mismanagement of dollars, what we have, the foreign reserves, what we have, right? Now, for the Chinese fertilizer ship, which is unacceptable, the government paid 6.9 million US dollars. So, likewise, Nitrogaja and all that, all these decisions that it's the government unwanted took, things. Yes. So, it affected the current economical crisis. So, that's why we say that as a government, you have to have a proper economical structure to manage. The situation which is not really useful. So, as a young, experienced, and educated person, so what is the best solution that we can get it for that? No, I mean, we will have to speak with IMF, uh, bank, and we the rules, and we we'll have to speak with our uh, importers, and we we'll have to speak with the exporters and come to a common ground. But That's currently, it's not happening in here. Currently, is not interested. They are interested in other things. So, uh, it's very unfortunate. Unfortunately. And if you will go back uh, two, three years back, okay, so it came, uh, there was a huge attack came, the East attack. Okay, and then the, uh, with the East attack and then the Corona crisis, all the areas has been flopped up, especially the tourism. 
So, what do you think about in the in this area, like as a? No, tourism? I mean tourism is something that we can. I mean, we can uh, structure tourism. We can make it up. So that it's a matter of how we plan Sri Lankan tourism in terms of you know, you, you talking about just tourism, health tourism. You have all kind of other tourism that you can have. So, I think as a country we have so much potential in terms of tourism. It's just that. We are not structured, we are not planned, we don't have a strategy how we are supposed to do it. If you go to Cambodia, if you go to Indonesia, if you go to Malaysia, if you go to Singapore, if you go to even India or Maldives, you know the tourists have so much activities to do, they have you know a structured plan for tourists, separate tourists like you know, you have the you have the low end tourists, you have high end tourists, you have mid end tourists, then you have Arab tourists separately, the Chinese tourists separately, the Eastern Europeans separately, the European separately, the Americans separately. So they have a structured, structured yeah. proper tourism plan. Where in Sri Lanka, you know, it's the same more thing. So even though there's a young uh, bunch of tourists come to Sri Lanka or uh, old folks come to Sri Lanka, it's the same thing that you could do. It's, there's no variant, there's no new thing, there's no much to see and whatever you see, it's not properly explained and transportation is quite difficult and uh, so, you know, it's, it's just the uh, name, Siloam, is keep running and people know that it's a beautiful life and people are nice, you know, with hospitality is so good, so people tend to come to Sri Lanka, but as Sri Lanka, the government of Sri Lanka has told the board, we are not offering anything back to the tourists, so it's very unfortunate. So, you think uh, who will be the responsible? It's a uh, government or the tourism? It's most likely the government. Government, right. Most likely the government. So, if I'll ask uh, something like that, uh, like uh, as a young leader, what are the qualities and things that to hold the leadership as? I think the uh, most important quality that any politician should have is to number. And what's important is that in a leader, you should understand the very temporary power that you've been given by the people. So, the time that you have given to your office, you work maximum to your capacity to serve the people. Right? You should not have any other intention but to serve the people. So, if you come to politics thinking that you would serve the people, and that's the only motivation that you have, and you are determined to do that. As a Sri Lanka, you should not be uh, marginalized that I am a single being, I am a Hindu, I am a Muslim, yeah. or a Catholic, or Buddhist. And you should not separate yourself. We are Sri Lanka. We should build a country together out of the Singaporeans. You know, we are talking about Martin Mohammed and you know, Malaysia and all of that. They all build their countries on a very strong foundation that is nationalism. Nationalism in terms of Sri Lanka. We are Sri Lanka. That is our we have to come up with the patriotism so far. So uh, I think that's what as leaders we should do. We should uh, encourage our youth to do so the same. And be uh, humble. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, uh, what I believe is, uh, really I admire your father, the late Dr. Charles Chavard. Because he, what I feel, and because I was so small when he was there, so then, uh, like, you know, he's really loved to the people, he's loved to the party, and he's loved to, he's, he's not thinking about himself personally, and he always think about the others. But currently, I saw it, uh, current politicians are not like that. Because they are always thinking about uh, their yes, own sir. benefits and their own self. That's where I've been born wrong. I mean, uh, we, we just celebrated the uh, Independence Day. But unfortunately, that we are this country has been led to by the leaders of this country. You know, we are in crisis, as you said, economical, social, political. And uh, our brother themselves have gone down. We are selling off our goal. And, uh, you know, China has put up a city, and all around the world you have China town, but we have China city in Sri Lanka. So, um, I mean, it's very unfortunate, but actually, we are in need for deforestation, we are not taking care of our wildlife, we are not taking care of our people, the education system, even though we talk about it, so um, we 
bracket order sometimes, but actually the education system is very poor in Sri Lanka. Health system is very poor. People are very poor. And they are uh, the working their own people. benefits, right? Young people are trying to leave the country. So, I mean, politicians are responsible, as you said, that they only think of themselves. You know, they are able to do their happy life in their own life. And some of the governments are not pinpointing uh, in large scale, but there are a few governments are also who are responsible for what has happened. So, I think uh, it's our time now to change all. Yeah, but uh, you know, uh, what I feel is uh, when it comes to the woman, as a woman, okay, the mainly in Sri Lanka, uh, more than 50% is for the women only. But I don't see in the, especially the parliament, there's a lack of population for the women. They are giving no, the chances. I, 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 I think uh, the reason why women are not being represented in the parliament is because of the political structure which has been structured here in Sri Lanka. It's very difficult. I mean, as a man, it's difficult for me. You know, it's, it's a tough job. So I think that's why a lot of women are not representing the parliament. But I remember during the government's government, we brought the law. We amended the local government body structure and then uh, we structured in a way where even 27% women must contest Regardless, even if they lose, they should be in the local government. Local government. Yeah. They should be appointed to the local government. So, we took our steps towards that. I mean, when you talk about sustainable development goals, one of the most important things is you know, women rights and equality. So, it's, it's something that we all should work on. I mean, as a country, we should be ashamed of ourselves. We have only 12% representative in the parliament. Whereas, we have 51% women. I like to ask some personal questions from you. Yeah, yeah so you are a, you are married yeah. with a, you are a husband of the lovely, beautiful wife. Okay, whom I know very well uh, from his child, from her childhood itself. So what? How how is the support that you are getting from your family? Uh, actually, Natasha, she's all coming from a political background. Grandfather was politician. Yes. Both her parents are from politician. Both are politician in the parliament right now. So uh, she knows how the politics in terms of uh, work at home and at work. So uh, she's very helpful, she's very committed and uh, determined to do uh, women related uh, political work with me. So we have something called Jaramita. Yeah. We train rural women to income families to uplift their economical situation at home. So uh, we have been doing that for quite some time. So Natasha is very much involved in that. So she's been a strong pillar in my life and uh, I'm grateful to have her with me. And I have two children, uh, Sepin and Kavi. Sepin is just like my father. Uh, his personal is the same. So yeah, that's, that's my that's that's life. life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, finally I'd like to ask like this. If in case, if one day you have to say goodbye to the politics, mm-hmm. so again to the society, we can see you as a doctor? Yeah, most certainly. I mean, uh, I have not had to do politics forever. I have to do politics when I feel I should come out of it. I will most certainly step out of it. And once I step out of it, I will uh, decide what I'm going to do next. I am not actually. But as a teacher, I might uh, get into my uh, medical Because practice. that was your father's uh, dream. dream. So I, but I don't know whether I will practice here or whether I will go migrate. to the US or because I am back from the US. I, I don't know, I haven't really thought it. Let the time decide. I, I always believe that it's God and God has a plan for us. So I, so I, I, so I even shows us the correct path we have to go. Yes. Yeah. yes. Okay, finally we have come to the end of the conversations. Uh, it's really nice, it's really amazing conversation and I had with uh, Mr. Dr. Kavin Jayavardana. Okay, he's so friendly and he's friendly, so he accepted our invitation. And thank you so much, Doctor, for accepting our thank invitation. You. And uh, I would like to invite you all uh, to just subscribe our channel and be with us if you are still not with us. So you can subscribe and watch another segments like this. So until that, take care.
Thank you.